Okay, well, I, I noticed that earlier today Sandy had made a remark on Facebook about we should have called the series instead of No Compromise, we should have called it Countercultural. And I wanted to say amen because I'm about to do the same thing. Um, essentially, with the finances, I will go a little bit into my own personal story. My husband was unable to be here tonight. He's on the worship team at church, and we just got back from vacation. He didn't want to um, skip out for a third week in a row, so he said he might try and stop in if he gets out um, a little bit on the early side. But like I said, I'll share a little bit about our own personal financial story. Um, the things that I'm talking about are almost solely out of a book that I put on the last page for you. It was called, I think, Your Money Counts or Your Money Matters um, by Howard Dayton. And that is a piece of material that is put out by Crown Financial Ministries. Has anybody, can you raise your hand if you've heard of Crown Financial Ministries before? Fantastic. Um, has anybody here ever taken one of their courses before? Okay. Um, that is one of the, the things that changed my life financially, was taking this course. And I'm very happy to say that we took it when we were only a year into marriage. So a lot of the things that I've heard other married couples have issues with, or even single people, we were able to kind of take care of right away, get on the same page and really communicate and get on the same wavelength as to how to handle our finances in the way that God would want us to handle them. Um, so just to, to give you a little intro, I have a verse, and if anybody would like to look it up for me, it's 2 Timothy 4.3. Okay. Thank you. This is kind of the intro to everything because it doesn't have anything to do with finances. It has more to do with studying things for yourself and not just trusting me. Do you all understand what that means? Pretty much just that you want to hear what you want to hear and you'll go somewhere where they're saying what you want to hear even if it's not sound doctrine, even if it's not something that's godly. And I am not here to scratch your ears tonight at all. I'm here to try and present God's word the best that I can. But I'm telling you that I'm not perfect and that I'm giving you lots of scriptures. We might not have time to read through all of them tonight, but I'm, that's the reason why you have the handout. So that when you go home tonight, you can actually read through the scriptures and you can um, just determine from your own point of view, look through things and make sure that I wasn't off in anything because I want you to hold me accountable like that. Um, the other, do you still have your Bible open, Ashley? Because there's another one that's right there. Sure. Second Timothy two fifteen. Okay. <clears throat> do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. And the version that I have, I have the King James version, and it says, "Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that need, needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth." So whenever you're studying God's word, you're learning to <coughs> rightly divide what is truth from what is not truth. And I just encourage you in that pursuit because it's a very worthy pursuit to do that. Um, don't let yourself be pulled in by the latest um, Christian actor that's saying something or by your favorite blogger that you have no idea what their actual lifestyle is like or what they truly believe other than what they're writing down. Um, not everybody can be right, and so you need to be able to go through and figure that out for yourself. Mm -hmm. Also, I'm not going to go too much into this because I know that it seems to have been a <coughs> recurring topic in this series of Bible studies about being countercultural. We do not live in a godly society. We live in a secular society. So we should not expect that what the world is telling us is what God is telling us, correct? Definitely. Okay. Same thing goes with finances. The world is telling us so many things that are completely anti-biblical, and what we are going to try and do tonight is go through and determine which things are godly and which things are not godly. So on your sheet of paper, if you notice, all of those little boxes, and they on the left-hand side it always says society says, and on the right-hand side it says scripture says. Um, I'm not going to take credit for this idea. This was, again, an idea from the book that I'm telling you that I'm pretty much going out of from this Bible study. Um, also, at the very end of the Bible study tonight, we have an opportunity for anybody who's interested in going deeper. Um, my husband Eric and I are willing to lead one of the Crown small groups, 
And so if anybody's interested in taking that, then that will be offered to you as an opportunity. Okay, so what would you say if I said that your checkbook tells me more about your priorities than pretty much anything else in your life? Would you agree with that? Even if you don't use a checkbook, maybe your debit card, your ATM <coughs> card, um, your credit card statements, any of those things will show you where, because where you spend your money is what you value, generally speaking. Um, 16 out of the 38 parables in the Bible concern handling money and possessions. The Bible offers 500 verses on prayer, fewer than 500 on faith, but over 2,350 on money and, fi and possessions. He definitely wants us to know his perspective on this very important area. Um, most Christians either don't know or haven't applied God's financial principles to their lives. It's almost like you can imagine going down in the water to be baptized, and as you're going down, you're holding your wallet out of the water saying, okay, God, you can have all of me except for my wallet. My wallet I'm going to keep out, and I'm going to spend my money the way that I want to spend my money. Um, but if you read in Luke 16, 11, who would like to do that one for me? Does anybody else have their Bible? Awesome, thank you. 16, 11. So the unrighteous mammon would be like worldly wealth, whatever you actually have in your pocket. And then who is going to entrust the true riches if you're showing yourself to be unfaithful with the money that we have on earth? So to start off my story, I was not at all financially faithful to God in my early years. I started working when I was like 10 years old. I was a really mature 10. And I had a lot of babysitting jobs at that point, which now I'm looking back and I don't even have kids yet. And I cannot believe that people let me babysit when I was only 10 years old. But I had money coming in. I had a paper route. I had those babysitting jobs coming in later. I taught some private music lessons when I was in high school. And I had almost nothing to show for it. I spent pretty much everything that I made. Um, my dad made me save a few dollars out of my paper route paycheck to put into a mutual fund, which I still have actually, but it's not, it's nowhere near what I actually made. I have no idea how much I actually made because I did not keep records and I just spent everything that came into my pocket. So when it came time for college, I did get some scholarships and my parents were able to help me out with the first like year and a half of my college tuition payment, but after that I was on my own. So I took out uh, loans for everything. I was working a little bit during college, but I was like a tour guide. It really wasn't paying me very much. So then I meet my husband, Eric, and he actually was very financially faithful. And he had also been working from a young age. He used to work in a greenhouse when he was growing up. He saved enough money that he could pay for his own vehicles, that he could pay for all of the things that go along with vehicles. And when it came time for us to get married, he bought me a beautiful engagement ring. And he also paid for our wedding because that was something that my parents had told me up front when I was a little girl, we're not paying for your wedding. so. <laughs> you better be saving for it. Well, I wasn't saving for it. So I got very, very lucky that I met a man who was financially faithful because the two of us together were able to, to cover that expense. Um, but like I was saying, very early in our marriage was when Crown was introduced to us. And so that was back in 2006. And it's a 10 week small group study that walks you through how to handle your finances according to the Bible. And so the very first thing that they tell you is that you should try and get out of debt if you're in debt. Well, I'm hoping that since the crowd is on the younger side that we have a lot of people who are debt free that haven't gotten to that point yet. That would be my dream because mm -hmm. I would love to catch you before you make any mistakes. But I am also realistic and I understand that in a group this size there have got to be people that are struggling with debt right now. Whether it's car loans, whether it's tuition payments or student loans, um, credit cards, any of those types of things. So we started going through and they started showing us all of these principles and we made it our goal to pay off my student loans and we also had two car payments at the time. And within four years of taking the class, we were able to pay it all off. So I'm happy to say that now, other than the mortgage that we just took out on a house that we bought last year, we're totally debt free. Um, and it is such a good feeling. Mm -hmm. Such a good feeling. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. So both of our cars are paid off, all the student loans are paid off, and we also, I went for my master's degree, master's degree during that time, and we paid for it out of our savings mm -hmm. so that I didn't have to take out more student loans. Um, so it's possible. Okay. So you should have some boxes on your page, and the first one says, Society says God plays no role in handling money, and my happiness is based on being able to afford my desired standard of living. But scripture says, as you learn and follow the scriptural principles of how to handle money, you will draw close to Christ and learn to be content in every circumstance. Mm -hmm. Um, when we're talking about our finances, there's two parts. There's God's part and there's our part. God's part, God has the bigger part and we have the smaller part. So his three things that he takes care of for you is he is the owner of all things. That doesn't mean all things that are outside your house. It doesn't mean all things that you don't spend your money on. It means everything, everything you spend your money on, the money itself your car, your house, your apartment, your clothes that are on your back. He owns it all, and he will take care of, um, of all of those things. One of the stories that really had stood out to me in the Crown literature was that if you believe that you really possess something, then you get upset if something happens to that. Like, let's say you just bought a brand new car, and you're thinking, oh, this is my brand new car. I've never had a new car before. And the very first day you have it, somebody opens their door right into it and puts a huge ding in it. Mm -hmm. How mad are you going to get if you believe that it's your car? Yeah. You're going to get pretty upset. But if you believe that everything is God's and that he's just entrusted it to you for the time yeah. being, then you can I, – I actually heard somebody who said this. He said – God, I don't know why you would want to dump that big in your car, but there it is. <laughs> There's a total difference in perspective there if you feel like it's yours as opposed to if you believe that God gave it to you and just entrusted it to you. The second thing that it's God's part to, to take care of is control. He is also in control of everything. Um, sometimes he does allow difficult circumstances, and I think this is the first that you guys are writing in. The first reason why God allows difficult circumstances is to accomplish his intentions. Probably the best Bible story I can think of to illustrate this is the story of Joseph. You have his brothers that mean harm to him, they mean to kill him or just have him sold into slavery, and God allowed it to happen even though he loved Joseph because he was in control and he could see into the future when none of None of the people involved could. And so he was still in control, even though Joseph probably was wondering about where God went. The second reason why God allows difficult circumstances is to develop our character. <coughs> Definitely true. I know I've pulled much closer to God when I've been in the middle of a difficult circumstance and um, have definitely grown through those situations. And lastly, the third reason why he would allow difficult circumstances is to discipline his children. And there are a couple of scriptures that talks about the discipline of God and how the Lord disciplines those who he loves. And even though it's painful at the time, it is to produce righteousness in you in the, in the long run. Um, so those would be the main reasons for that. And then the third part that God has is being the provider. We've got all of the Jehovah names, and one of them is Jehovah Jireh, which is God, the Lord, our provider. Um, and would anybody like to look up something for me? Let's go to Matthew 6.33. So the things that were listed actually earlier in the chapter were what you eat and drink and what you will wear. Those are the things that God said not to, that will be given unto you. Um, do those sound like needs or like wants to you? The things that he said that he would provide. Needs. Clothing and food. Like Those sound like needs to me as well. Can anybody uh, tell me what they think the difference between a want and a need is? I think a want is that you don't need. 
<laughs> That's pretty much the easiest way to say it. Vinny, did you have something else? Between needs and wants, the Lord promises that he's going to provide for our needs. He does not say that he's going to provide for all of our wants, although in my experience, he does provide an awful lot of our wants, um, especially in America. We live in such a blessed society. We, get, we have so much more than many people in the world have. But I just wanted to make sure that you understood the difference between those things and which one God promises to provide for. So in... Closing of this section, society says that what I possess, I alone own, and I alone control my destiny. But scripture says that what I possess, God owns. He is the sovereign living God who controls all events. So now we're moving on to what our part is. And like I said, we don't have as big of a part. Our part is to be good and faithful stewards with what God has given us. He promises that he is over everything, that he controls everything, and he will provide for our needs. But it's our job to take what he's given us and to be good and faithful with those things. Um, Matthew 25, 21 says, His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Um, and also, 1 Corinthians 4, 2 says, Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. So there are a whole bunch of areas that we need to be faithful in. Um, one of the areas is with all of our resources. Um, when I say all of our resources, I mean 100%, not the 10% that we normally will entrust to the church as a tithe, but 100%, because it's not just the money that we're actually handing over to the church or handing over to ministries or to charities, but it's the way that we spend all of our money. Also, we are to be faithful regardless of how much we have, even if you have very little. And actually, I was just reading a statistic that said that low-income families, on average, donate more than high- and middle-income families do. They were pretty close together. It was within, like, percent to 1%, I think. But it, was, it just amazed me. Because normally, the way we would think of it is, oh, well, once I have the extra, then I'll give all of this money. But one of the... I think I'm skipping ahead of myself. But, oh, no, here it is. Um, I had found a quote. It said, it's not what I would do if I had a million dollars. It's what I'm doing with the $10 I've got. Wow. So then we also need to be faithful in little things because Luke 16.10 says that whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much, and whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dis dishonest with much. We need to be faithful with the possessions of others. How many times have we borrowed something and forgotten to give it back or given it back in worse condition than we took it? Um, Luke 16, 12 says, And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? Mm -hmm. Keep that in mind when you are uh, in possession of somebody else's book or somebody else's whatever you're borrowing from them. Make sure that you return it to them in, t in the same condition or better than when you took it. Um, also, faithfulness builds character, and faithfulness leads to contentment. So society says, you earned your money, now you can spend it any way you choose, and you'll be happy. That's not what scripture says. Scripture says you can only be content if you have been a faithful steward, handling money from the Lord's perspective. So now we're going to get into kind of the nitty-gritty <laughs> details of what God's financial principles are and why we should abide by them. So... The reason why it's really crucial to follow these principles, there's three main reasons. The first one is that how we handle money affects our fellowship with the Lord. Going back to Luke 16, 11, which we had read earlier, so if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? Okay, secondly, possessions compete with the Lord. Matthew 6, 24 says, No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And the third principle is that much of life revolves around the use of money. 
So it's important that we understand God's financial principles because we are using money on a daily basis. It's a very large part of our life, and so we need to make sure that we are um, following the way that God would have us use everything. So, oh, sure. The very first one was fellowship, I believe. And the second one was possessions. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, so um, I think on your form or on your paper that you just have little like arrow indentations. I had tried doing numbers and my computer was being silly. And, uh, so if you want to number the little arrows so that we're on the same page, that's fine. But the very first one is to avoid debt. That's the first of God's financial principles. Um, can I have someone look up Proverbs 22 7 for me, please? Thank you, Melissa. Oh, it's okay. Yeah. The rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is servants of the lender. Okay, I'm going to say that one again because it's it. the first time I heard it, it just kind of stuck in me because at that point I was still quite in debt. Okay, the rich, just as the rich rule the poor, so the borrower is servant to the lender. Can I just ask what kind of debt you were in? If you're willing to share. Was like it just school loan debt or was and it? car debt. We didn't have any credit cards. No. Well, we use credit cards, but we pay it off at the end of the month. So we had two car payments and twenty five thousand dollars in student loans. One might have been worth less. I can't remember because we got rid of it very shortly after we paid paid it off. Yeah, I can't remember for sure because it was a couple of years ago now. But uh, but yeah, that was what we what we were able to pay off in those four years. Can we read that verse from the message Bible? Really quick? Sure, go ahead. Okay. It's a great thing. Oh, where's that? <laughs> Yeah, just kind of like the endless cycle. Uh, so 
I just wanted, I had a comment on what okay. both of you guys said. Yeah. Is I think like with the mortgage in general, that's a huge responsibility mm -hmm. where you're going to have to take sacrifices at yep. some point. And um, I think what, what they're looking for is, because they're giving you 60, 70, 80, 100, $200,000 yeah. for, for something that they make, I mean, a lot of times they, they're not going to make poor investments, but um, they, they want to be able to see that you can handle that kind of obligation. Mm -hmm. So yes, you may be being financially responsible, but financially responsible person could have a credit card and not use it or pay it off every month. And that's right. kind of what they want to see. They want to see that, uh, um, okay, but kind of like a paper trail. Yeah, yeah, I mean, otherwise, if they don't know what you're doing. They don't know if you're a drug dealer or whatever. whatever. I mean, they just want to see that you can handle that type of um, obligation. And I do understand what you're saying, but at the just to kind of be devil's advocate on the other side of things, you could have somebody who has a credit history. It might not be a great credit history because maybe they were late on payments or maybe they did rack up a lot of debt who are able to buy a house simply because they have a history. Whereas somebody who, like Ashley is saying, is having a hard time getting any credit established because she doesn't have it established so they won't give her credit is kind of, I don't know. There's ways around that. There, there are. But uh, let's pull it back together and keep on going or else we'll be here all night. Um, would you guys believe it if I said that 56% of divorces are a result of financial tension? I would say financial tension and probably a lack of communication about the financial tension. Maybe even lying about the finances and not being truthful with your spouse about where you actually are at in your marriage and what the finances are looking like. Um, or maybe just having different priorities with how you're going to spend your money. You've got one person that's a saver and one person that's a spender, and then you're fighting with each other about things. Um, one of the things that Crown talks about is when is it okay to owe money? And they have three criteria that they use to say that it would be okay to owe money. One is that the item purchased is an asset with the potential to appreciate or produce an income. One is that the value of the item equals or exceeds the amount that's owed against it. Or another is that the debt is not so large that repayment puts undue strain on the budget. So you can see how a home mortgage would fit into the allowable debt um, or borrowing money for like your business or your, or your vocation would also fit into that. Um, however, they're kind of silent when it comes to student loans. Um, I was looking up some articles on the Crown website because I wasn't seeing anything in the books about it and I couldn't remember from taking the class what they said about it. And when I was looking through essentially what they're saying is that it's definitely not a sin to take out an educational loan, but it's not going to give you the same kind of immediate return if something changes and you need to just get rid of it. Like if you have an asset that is actually appreciating and you find yourself in a position where you just can't keep it, you can sell it and make your money back. That's not always the case with education. You could be going for three and a half years and have something happen to your health and not be able to finish and not get a degree and not get the job that you thought you were going to be able to get with that degree. So it's really about planning in advance and really trying to save up as much money as you can so that you don't have to take out as much in loans, especially not in student loans. Um, and, and especially with the economy the way that it is, I feel like a lot of people are pushing education because there aren't jobs available, but when are the jobs going to be available after you rack up sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollars in debt that then needs to come due and be repaid within six months after you, you graduate? Right. So there's just a lot that needs to be taken into consideration with that. Mike. So now let's say you have fine for student aid for loans mm -hmm. available to you, or let's say you have a mortgage where you can put home equity loans. Mm -hmm. Would it be better to put it on a home equity loan? No, it would be better to save and then go to college mm -hmm. after you have the money saved up. But <laughs> I'm not really going to try and get into which would be better because I don't feel like it's really, yeah. I don't know. It, it would be a personal decision if that was something that you were going to look at, but I think that really the way that it's pointing is working and earning the money that you need so I that you don't go into debt. I just think, yeah, that's great if you can do that safe until you have the money to go, but if, if you're not educated, it's very hard to get an income that even supports you yet, supports yep. you enough to save. It is. And it's very hard. Because I've worked three jobs and didn't have enough. Because that, that was my philosophy, and, and now I'm against it. We'll be, get, we'll <laughs> so, be, we'll be getting into other ways that, so, so that talk I about this. I guess what I'm saying is if, if you're expected 
if, if I mean, you can't go into, you just got to be careful into the career choices. You, you can't, people are yep. going for like um, basic studies or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's like, what are you going to do with that? You got to go for a career that is actually going to, has jobs available. Yep. Yeah. So, so you can pay back that debt. Yep. Vinny.
15. Yeah? And we still use it to this day. Have you guys ever seen the envelope system for budgeting? You essentially just put, like, I have envelopes that I leave in my wallet. I only, I do four that are actual envelopes with cash that I restock every time that we have a payday. The rest of them I just keep track of on the computer in, a, in an Excel spreadsheet by different categories because I am particular like that. And I like having it all in front of me and it really helps me to do that. But with the cash, I have food, entertainment, miscellaneous, and clothing. And those I keep in cash all the time because those are the things that I would be tempted to overspend on if I was using a credit card. If I went to Wegmans and I just scanned the credit card, I don't have to care about how much I'm spending on things. But if I have a set amount of cash and the cash register rings up $50 and I have 48 then I have to ask them to take something off mm -hmm. of the register or out of my bag and put it back because I don't have the money to spend. And so it's a different mindset to yeah. do that. And Dave Ramsey talks about it. Crown talks about it as well. And one of the links that's on that last page of your um, your papers as well is for, um, it's called Envelopes, Crown em Envelopes. And it used to cost money. It's an online envelope budgeting system. and. All of a sudden, it's free. I don't know what happened and what changed, but it's now a free system. Amen. So if it's something that any of you would be interested in checking out, I gave you the link to use that. Okay, so after you establish a written budget, then you also list all of your assets so that you know what you actually own. You know what's worth something, where if you actually needed to sell things to pay down your debt, you know that you have a car that's worth this much. You know that you have um, maybe jewelry that's worth something or a house that's worth something. And you need to make a decision right away about if you're deep enough in debt, should I sell something immediately to just cut that debt down and stop paying as much interest as you're paying. Then you also list your liabilities. So you make a list of all the debts that you owe, what the interest rate is on each debt, and um, list it by creditor so that they're all separate. So if you have you know, a car loan and you have a student loan, I actually have like three student loans because they all split up into each year that I took them out. Um, so I listed them all that way, and the best way to start paying that debt down is start with your smallest one, because that's the one that feels like it's most achievable. Mm -hmm. It's the one that you can start putting extra money towards and start paying down the principal so that you're not paying so much interest. And then once you totally pay that one down, you can have a little celebration for yourself because you actually paid one off. Mm -hmm. But then instead of just stopping, you take the money that you had been putting towards the first one, and you start putting it towards the second one, and you start like snowballing it together. And before you realize it, you've got all of this extra money that's going towards debt repayment that you didn't even think you had available in your budget and you're paying off your last loan and having like a big huge party with all of your friends. <laughs> it does. It's a great job. Yeah. Okay, also you need to consider earning additional income, but this is really important without harming your relationship with the Lord and without harming your relationship with your family. Okay, because you're not called to overwork, you're not called right. to be absent in your family, and you definitely are not called to neglect your relationship with God. But there are some ways, especially if you have a family, where you could actually have some kind of a home-based business where your kids and your family are involved, or you know, trade babysitters with friends or family so that you can go somewhere and it's not going to be a huge burden either um, financially or like maybe they're staying with an aunt or an uncle so it's still family that's with your kids while, while you're gone. Uh, the next is that you are to accumulate no new debt. If you are not paying off your credit card at the end of the month, then you cut your credit card in half. You do some plastic surgery. <laughs> and you stop using that credit card because if you are really serious about getting out of debt, you cannot keep on adding to it or else it's just never going to end. You're never going to pay it off if you keep adding to it. Next is more of a heart issue. You need to be content with what you have. And that is so hard to do in our society today because we see commercials all the time that are like, oh, iPhone this, iPad this, you need this, you want this. Oh, my family has all three Kindles, one for each purpose. I just said, oh, we watch movies on this one, we read books on this one. This one we read books on in the sunlight. <laughs> no, there's, there's no end to it. There's just so much materialism all around us. And so you need to, if that's something you really struggle with, cut out how much TV you watch. Cut down on how many magazines you read, how many catalogs you look at, and don't go window shopping, not planning on spending any money, because you're going to spend money. Amen. Okay? And on the internet. <laughs> and on the internet, too. There's lots of good deals to be had, but there's also lots of bad deals to be had or just money to be spent on there. So, again, 
try and release yourself from some of that temptation and things will go a little bit easier. Next, if you really are in over your head, up to your eyeballs in debt, consider a radical lifestyle change. If you own a house, consider selling the house and moving into a smaller house. If you have a really nice car, but it's got tons and tons of payments left on it and expensive payments, consider selling that and buying a cheaper used car. Just anything that you can think of that's going to immediately reduce what you owe. And don't give up or delay. Once you make the decision, don't make excuses for yourself. Don't be like, oh, well, I know I want to pay this down, but I also really want to go to this event. And it might cost $200, but it's okay because it's a really cool event. And it's a Christian concert, so it's even better. Okay, you need to keep yourself in check. And even though it might be something that would benefit you, you need to stay within your resources. Okay? Yes. Um, gosh, I can't remember. I think they were saying that with bankruptcy that even though you're not required to pay anything back when you file for bankruptcy, that it would be good for you to offer to even make small payments once you, once everything went through. Um, that would be something, if you look on Crown's website and search bankruptcy, you'll probably find other articles about it so that you can get a better idea of what they, what from God's word they believe would be the godly thing to do in that situation. Mike? I was just going to share a story. A guy from my uncle's church, actually, he filed bankruptcy because he just couldn't handle it anymore. And what he did is he sold his car, so, and he got to keep his house, but he sold his house, he took the bus to work every day, mm -hmm. and he did make those changes, and he paid out every bit of that bankruptcy. That's awesome. And it does not happen very often because people generally are released and then they move on with their lives, and well, that's really awesome. So hard once you have that release, oh, yeah. it's required just to keep that commitment. Definitely. So society says you may use debt as often as you wish, buy now and pay later, but scripture says that the Lord discourages debt because he wants you free to serve him, and debt is putting you in slavery. Yeah. Okay. The second godly principle is to seek wise counsel. Can somebody read Proverbs 12, 15, please?
places that you should avoid counsel from, and I hope this goes without saying, fortune tellers, mediums, horoscopes, Ouija boards, and the occult, please do not seek counsel from any of these places. Okay, Definitely not wise, and there are a couple of scriptures that specifically say that they are not, not good places to go to. Also, be careful of people who are biased into the outcome of what you're asking them. If they stand to make money based on you doing one thing or the other, they're not a good person for you to really be asking. Okay, just keep those kinds of things in mind. So society says be your own person, stand on your own two feet, and you don't need anyone to tell you what to do. But scripture says the wise man is glad to be instructed, but a self-sufficient fool falls flat on his face. Mm -hmm. Okay. The third godly principle is absolute honesty, and this is so hard because this even includes like white lies. You're not supposed to tell white lies. You're not supposed to tell any lies at all. And the reasons for them. Number one, we cannot practice dishonesty and still love God. You might think about that and be like, well, yeah, I still love God, but your actions are saying something different. Your actions and your words need to jive with each other. Okay, we also can't practice dishonesty and love our neighbor because it says that we're not to lie, we're not to steal. And if you're stealing from your neighbor, you're not loving them. Okay, so keep that in mind again. Your actions and your words need to match each other. Honesty creates credibility for evangelism. I love this one. If you are totally honest and if you tell somebody, like if they ask you to lie about something or if they ask you to do something that goes against God's word and you say, well, I can't do that because I'm a Christian. Mm -hmm. It says a lot more than if you're like, well, this one time, yeah, I guess I could do that. Oh, by the way, you want to come to church with me on Sunday? <laughs> that makes no sense at all. So if we are going to be evangelizing, if we are going to be sharing our faith with other people, then our lives should be an open book, and we should be honest and faithful in everything that we do. And I think it is. I do. Um, I know that in some cases, people would maybe shy away from that if they're worried that there was a, a promotion on the line or something like that, but... I think there's a, a negative connotation to Christianity and society, and that will turn a lot of people off. It, it's I so won't lie because I'm a Christian? I mean, it, it's... I was just going to bring that uh, up. As soon as you said that, I'm like, courageous. Yeah. It, raise your hand if you've seen the movie Courageous. Yeah. Yes. And the one guy goes in and he's up for a promotion and the, the boss is like, well, here's, here's the, the deal. There's this, ki this shipment coming in next week and there's going to be like 18 of this product and I need you to write down that there were only 17 because I have a different use for that last one. And he, he was like in really hard times. His family was really struggling to make ends meet. And he, the boss gave him a, a day to go home and think about it. His wife was even kind of saying, we really need this job. Like, I'm not telling you what to do, but we really need this job. And he went in the next day and he said, I'm sorry, but I can't do that. And it was a test. And he passed the test and he got the promotion. But he was, he was willing to lose his job over the honesty and it turned totally around on him. Wait, okay, okay, maybe, you mis maybe I misspoke or mis people misunderstood. Well, you're, I know you're saying but that should we say because I'm a Christian. I, I, I'm saying, I, I certainly think do the right thing. And mm -hmm. certainly say, look, my values are better than that. Um, and my relationship with God is more important. But I just think Christ Christians in general have a negative connotation in society. So if you say it to someone, you're, I, yeah, I, I don't, I don't feel... How do you think you're a negativity if you're saying I'm not going to lie I'm a Christian, and you're studying. I don't know. We should not debate over this. <laughs> <laughs> but you have time, Andrew. Don't oh, worry. okay. Thank you. Um, and again, I keep on because I was preparing all this. Like I have things that I know I'm coming up on that I want to skip ahead to because when you're saying that one of the stories um, with Daniel, when he was like the best worker that King Darius had, and he. He didn't just leave it at being a good worker. He told the king why he was a good worker and what was making him the way that he was. And it turned an entire nation around because he was willing to be vocal about what his faith was and what he believes and have the work to back it up. Um, I think that's coming, yeah, that's definitely coming later. So forgive me when I say it again. It'll be a good reminder. <laughs> 
Um, okay, after honesty creates credibility for evangelism, honesty also confirms God's direction, and even the smallest act of dishonesty can be devastating. Um, the blessings that are promised for the honest include intimacy with God, a blessed family, long life, and prosperity, which are all things that I would love to have. I don't know about you. And the curses reserved for the dishonest are pretty much the opposites of those things. Alienation from God, family problems, death, and poverty. So I know I went fast, but it's all opposites. If you need me to read them again, I can. What? The curses or the blessings? The blessings. The second one was a blessed family. The third one was a long life. And the fourth was prosperity. Okay, so society says you can be dishonest because everyone else is. But scripture says that the Lord demands absolute honesty in even sm the smallest matters. Okay, we are on to, I think, my favorite one, which is generous giving. Um, Acts 20, 35 says, It is more blessed to give than to receive. And the first thing that I would encourage you to do when it comes to giving is examine your attitude, because giving should really be motivated out of love. If you are giving because you feel like it's what you're supposed to do, because it's what the Bible says, yes, God will still accept your your gifts that he's giving, or that you're giving him, but it means so much more to him. If you're giving with an open heart, if you are saying, God, I love you so much, this is another act of worship. I'm sacrificing for you. I'm giving you from the things that you've already given to me. So I understand that you provided, and now I'm giving it back to you. Mm -hmm. um, so in addition to it being awesome to, to give instead of receive, the giver actually does benefit from giving. And so some of the areas that the giver benefits are an increase in intimacy, development of character, um, investments for eternity, because the worldly currency is going to be worthless someday. And I love this quote. Um, do you guys know who Jim Elliott was? Yes. The martyred missionary in, um, he did a movie, End of the Spear, about him. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And the fourth area that you benefit as a giver is an increase in material blessings. And I need somebody to read 2 Corinthians 9, 8 for me. Because I want to know why we're supposed to experience an increase in material blessings when we give. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I leave that all? I don't have the same copy in front of you, so I can't remember what I had filled in. Oh, yeah. yeah. Increase in intimacy, <laughs> development of character. Investments for eternity. And an increase in material blessings. And did somebody have 2 Corinthians 9 8 ready? Go ahead. And God is able to make all grace abound for you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have abundance for every good work. Okay, so if you're showing God that you're faithful with the little things, He wants to give you more because He knows that you will use it the way that He wants you to use it. So He wants you to have an abundance for every good deed that comes your way, everything that you could give to. He wants you to be able to give to. So he's going to bless you when you are showing him that you're faithful and that you understand that it's not yours anyway. Okay, when it comes to the amount to give, in the Old Testament they required a tithe. And actually in Malachi, um, there's a verse that talks about how in the Old Testament, if you didn't tithe, that you were essentially robbing God. And who wants to rob God? That's not a good place to be in at all. And in addition to the 10% tithe, the Hebrews were to give offerings. 
In the New Testament, the tithe is not specifically rejected. It's also not specifically recommended. But what is recommended is that you give in proportion to the material blessings that you've received, and it definitely commends sacrificial giving. Mm -hmm. Sacrificial, to me, is more than 10%. Sacrificial is something that actually hurts you a little bit. Wrong, yeah. Something where you have to hold off yeah. on buying something, maybe so that you can bless somebody else, mm -hmm. and then later on maybe save for what you're looking to do um, with that money. In my life, I view the first giving, trusting God with the first 10% of my income as a way of showing, like a symbol that I'm trusting him with my life. And then in addition to that, the offerings come from love. I mean, you, you come across either missionaries, you come across ministries, you come across other people that are speaking into your life that you really want to bless, you want to help them out with their ministry. Um, I've heard lots of people say that they can't afford to tithe, and I really believe that you can't afford not to. Um, it's a totally different mindset. Just like what I told you about the ding in the car door and thinking it's yours and being all upset about it and hanging on to it really tight, when you open your hands and just let that money go, it is such a freeing feeling, and it's just a way of showing God that you trust him and that you understand that he is the owner, the controller, the provider of everything. Mike. I'm only ask this question because I know two people who took two different routes on this. Okay. They made very little. They couldn't really support themselves. And, um, like, they already cut all the, the expenses you're saying, you know, radical life change. They already made those things, and they still couldn't afford to do the 10% tithe. And one ended up like trusting God and taking loans out. The other just didn't talk. Okay. That's interesting. What do you, what do you, like they, they said they were trusting God. And they, I know people who, who, they lost their job. I mean, they were trusting that they would get that income back. But, right. Um, at that point, they already sold their house. They already sold their cars. They already sold their, um, and, and this was like a couple year thing where they were out of work. And, yeah, I'm really not sure. I mean, the way that I would probably look at it is that if you lost your job, you don't have an income to tithe on, and that I would just be giving whatever right, I have, could afford to give. You have unemployment coming yeah, in. Yeah, that's and true. With the unemployment that was coming in, the one person I'm thinking of, um, they they couldn't, you know, they, they as I said, they sold everything and um, bought a small house, very, very, as bare minimum as they can get. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, they, they just trusted God that he would provide and tithe that 10%, but... Putting them in debt. I, it's a the the I think that the older generation can really testify to the fact that you cannot outgive God. Yeah. And that 10%, I mean, it, yeah, it if we didn't, we wouldn't have survived. Yeah. You know, it's it's a mindset. It's it's counting your 10 oranges that somebody gave to you and you hurry up and go get one get rid of one of them. Yeah. You you know, you learn to live. I think that the society has learned not to live. Beyond, they live so much beyond their means mm -hmm. that they think, and we were poor too. I mean, we knew what it was like not to have money, yeah. but to not, not you can't outgive God and God's going to give it back to you. Yeah. That money you're giving to you is also a protection. I was taught that that 10% is a yeah. protection. That was that it's a shield yeah. that God yeah. shields yeah. over you um, with that 10%. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's some extreme, extreme, that would consider that Right. circumstance. And in circumstances like that, that's when you go and seek your wife's counsel. You get yes. advice from the people yes. who have, you know have wisdom over you and present your case. Would, would you recommend this? What else can I do? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there's, there's extreme situations. Right. Right, there are. And actually what I was going to go to next is that among the people that I've heard say that they can't afford to tithe, I have noticed an awful lot of possessions that are very expensive. I've noticed iPhones, I've noticed iPads, I've noticed people who have cable TV or satellite TV or a new car. And it's not that you can't afford it, that you choose to spend your money in a different way. It's a different priority. And I'm not, I, I know that your friend was a different situation because it was so extreme, like what Sandy was saying. But in non-extreme cases, you really have to examine what your priorities are if you are saying that you can't afford to tithe or if you can't afford to give offerings. Um, so keep that in mind. And Eric wanted me to add this in. 
God does not want us to just live like paupers. He does want to bless us. He, it's okay if you have some nice things. You know, I'm not saying that you need to sell all of those gadgets that you have. I'm saying that maybe the next time that you really want that upgrade and it's going to put you back a couple hundred dollars and at the same time you know that a, a friend of yours is really in need or that there's a ministry that's really in need, maybe reconsider the upgrade. Okay, right. just think about those kinds of things when you're about to spend money and pray to God about it. If you're praying to him about relieving debt, why not pay, pray to him about um, expenses that you're about to have or about items that you want to purchase and see if you feel peace about it. See if he's releasing you and saying, sure, that's okay if you have that, if you go ahead and spend your money that way. Mm -hmm. Lynn? I just wanted to say, I know that God has been faithful to us. And a lot of things that we've done through to put that first amount first. Mm -hmm. And not look at it as we can't afford it after we've spent the money, mm -hmm. even paying bills right the book. The first thing is, is we tie to say, Lord, you are first in our lives. Now we need to trust you mm -hmm. for this, for our car payment, for yeah. this, for this. And he has really been faithful in times that we shouldn't have made it. Yep. And, I know. And, and I have to say that I've heard people calling it miracles in your checkbook. There are some times when I have no idea how extra money got into the checkbook, and I am meticulous when it comes to balancing the checkbook and knowing where the money came from, and there are just some times where I'm like, this doesn't make any sense, but we've got more money than I thought we were supposed to have. Or, like, all of a sudden, we'll get our tax refund money back, or the, the number for the refund, and it totally should have been less this year than last year, and it's more instead. Like, just weird things like that, and the only thing that I can really attribute it to is God choosing to use that in your life. So it's really cool when you allow him to work that way, when you when you get out of the way and let him do those miracles in your life. Okay, when we talk about who to give to, the first thing that you need to make sure is that, especially once you are married, that you are providing for your family, um, specifically your immediate family. But 1 Timothy 5.8 says, If anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for his immediate family, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. That's some pretty harsh criticism. Okay, so keep that in mind. That's number one. Then number two is your local church, your Christian workers, and your ministries. And especially the people that are speaking into your life. The people that you are receiving your instruction from. Because 1 Timothy 5.17 says the worker deserves his wages. Galatians 6.6 6 says anyone who receives instruction in the word must share all good things with his instructor. And then in addition to the tithe, you are to give offerings to other ministries and to the poor. God has a special heart for the poor. And when I say the poor, I... I've seen firsthand because I went to Bolivia a few years ago. My husband and I sponsor kids that live there, third world country, poverty like you will never see in America. You just won't. Okay, here when you're poor, you still have a roof over your head usually, unless you're homeless. But the most people who call themselves poor still have a roof over their head. They still have clothing. They still have food. They have the basic needs. The people in the third world countries make like less than a dollar a day and send their kids to look for scrap metal in the dump because that's how desperate they are. So there's just a total difference between those things. And Jeremiah 22:16 says, he defended the cause of the poor and needy and so all went well. Is that not what it means to know me, declares the Lord, caring for the poor and needy. So when you're considering whether or not to give to a charity, it is helpful to examine whether they are good stewards of the money that they receive. Because if you're being a good steward of your money, you don't want to give it to somebody who's not going to treat it with the same reverence. Right. So I would suggest going to CharityNavigator.com, which is one of the links that I have on that last page for you. And you can search any charity or ministry, and they have up to a four-star rating. And it specifically outlines different areas of how they spend their money. There's usually a financial chart, and it talks through all of that stuff. Um, the ministry that, that we sponsor our, child th or our children, we've got three of them, um, is through Compassion International. If you've ever heard of them before, they're a fantastic ministry. Four stars on Charity Navigator. Um, we volunteer with them as well because you can just see... 
your money at work, you can see the, the efforts at work in all of those countries. Um, and we, in addition to that, have also made a decision that we generally focus our giving to Christian ministries as opposed to secular charities. Because the way we look at it is that everybody is giving to the secular charities, you know, to the cancer charities and to the, um, all of the different disease charities, but the, the only people that are really supporting the Christian ministries are Christians, and we are kind of outnumbered. So it's important to keep those places going, especially if they are good stewards of the money. So society says it is more blessed to give, to receive than to give, sorry. And scripture says it is more blessed to give than to receive. Okay, next. Oh, sorry. My now, that money, like sponsoring the children, is that part of your tithe? Nope, or is that in that's offering in addition to the tithe. And when we came back from Bolivia, we... Our hearts broke while we were there because we were in a house and one of the fathers who was being translated for us said, we are so <coughs> grateful for the sacrifice that you make to help our children. And Eric and I felt this big because it was not a sacrifice for us to sponsor those two children at all with our financial situation. And so we got back and we sponsored a third child, which was a little bit more of a sacrifice. But the, the whole idea of the amount of wealth that we really have in America, even if you feel like you don't, all it takes is comparing what other people don't have to what you have, and it makes you feel like you're a millionaire. Okay, so our next, um, our next uh, principle for handling our money is to work hard. Whatever you do, oh, this is Colossians 3, 23 and 24. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. So God is in charge of giving you your job skills. He's in charge of your success, and he's also in charge of controlling your promotions. And once we understood that, it was such a relief off of my husband Eric's back, especially the promotion part because he always wanted to be a good provider for our family, but he was always trying to do it of his own accord, like pushing forward and pushing forward. And then once he realized that he wasn't in control of any of that, it was a huge burden off of his back, and he has been promoted. He's been promoted two or three times since that time, and in times that we never would have expected it. Is he here? Yeah. <laughs> Is he listening to me? <laughs> um, also, even though we are to work hard, we're not supposed to overwork, okay? God instituted the Sabbath rest for a reason. He can make those six days more productive than the, the seven that you're trying to do on your own. So take that day of rest for your own emotional health, your mental health, even your physical health, because it's something that God instituted for you. Um, and here's where that story about Daniel came in that I already told you about. Um, you know, that as employees, we are to be honest and faithful and prayerful and honoring to our employer and our employees, but that we need to verbalize our faith. And that was something that I felt was missing in the job that I had for five years. I was a music teacher in a public school, and I felt like I had, like, something holding my tongue where I was not allowed to say anything because if I did, I would be fired. Um, it was very, very constricting. Like, I would want so badly to say something to some of my children that I had in classes and wouldn't. Um, and now I'm working at a private Christian school, and the freedom that I feel is just outstanding and amazing. Um, I wish that I could have had that freedom in the public setting where it could have maybe had more of an impact, but it's just not the way that it is. So if you're considering a career path, consider a career path where you're allowed to talk about your faith because it's something that God commands us to do. And you don't want to be disobedient to God. You want to be able to obey him um, and be able to keep your job at the same time. So society says work as little as possible because labor is distasteful or work as much as possible because your job is all important. But scripture says work as unto the Lord with excellence as your standard. Work hard, but do not overwork. Okay, here comes my sidebar. And this is sort of related to the finances. It goes a little bit off topic, but I'll bring it back. Okay, because we have an overwhelming younger single crowd here, I feel that it's really important for you to start thinking about some things that maybe you haven't been thinking about. Men, I want you to start thinking about providing for a family. 
you shouldn't be spending all the money that you're earning on gadgets and trinkets and different things like that because you should be saving some of that money so that when you have a family you can provide adequately and so that your wife doesn't feel pressure to have to go out and work if you have children because that's something that I feel is really important that that mother be there helping to, to raise the child up in the way of the Lord so that those children are not a lost generation. Um, and on the same path, parents that need to teach their sons that that is one of their roles, that they are saving their money and they're going to be caring for their family. Um, going back to 1 Timothy 5.8, that was the scripture that was talking about needing to care for your relatives and specifically your immediate family or else you're worse than, a, than an unbeliever. So keep that in mind as well. There are a couple of, in my opinion, some exceptions, like if um, you're unmarried and the wife or the girlfriend winds up getting pregnant, I feel like it's more important for you to just get married than to necessarily have the provision already in place. There's other, you know, extreme circumstances like that, but in general, if you're following God's will and you're following where he would want you to go, then try and have that provision built up in advance. Um, also, this is kind of strange, because when I was growing up, like, chivalry was still around, and my, my brothers got taught to hold doors open for me and for my mom, and, you know, I got to always ride in the front seat when I was with my brothers. They sat in the back seat because that was just the way things were done. And now I feel like men are, well, I feel like a lot of women are even encouraging this, that they don't want to be treated that way. They want to be treated as equals. They want to do everything that the men can do. And... So it's kind of like, I don't know, it's double-sided. Some men feel that way. Some men would love to still be chivalrous, but women won't let them. Some women would love to be treated that way, and the men around them have been told, no, that's not the way that you treat women anymore. Um, and then that causes problems when you get into a marriage relationship later on down the road where the Bible clearly states that women are supposed to submit to their husbands. Mm -hmm. Okay, If you are already of the mindset that, oh, I'm not going to be submitting to any man, no, I'm just as good, I'm equal, I can be a breadwinner too, then what happens when you decide, I'm going to be a lawyer? Is being a lawyer really very, I don't know, would you imagine it would be easy to be a mother, a really good mother that's taking care of her kids all the time, and be a lawyer at the same time? Is being a lawyer expensive to get your education and time-consuming? So you're going as a single woman who has no ties, you're not married, you don't even have any prospects, you're deciding, I'm going to be a lawyer. And you rack up six digits of debt in college, and then you find Mr. Wright in law school, and you get married, and you have a baby, and you decide, oh, I really want to stay home. How heartbreaking is that when you cannot because you would probably file for bankruptcy because you have so much debt that you can't do anything else, that both people are used to such a standard of living that you have to just keep on working and working and the kids go into daycare and there's nobody raising them up in the way of the Lord, at least not on a regular basis. So just take some of these things and think about them now, even if you don't have any prospects for marriage in, in your path in front of you. Think about your career choice. Think about things that, like ladies, think about things that are not careers that are going to train you to be good wives and mothers instead of sabotage your future. I just recently, I've talked to a, a bunch of ladies who that exact, almost that exact same scenario happened to, not with being a lawyer, but just with going to college and paying a ton of money in college loans and thinking that their career was going to be what they really wanted. And then once they figured out that they really wanted the baby and the stay-at-home mom thing, their ship had passed and it was too late for them and they couldn't do it. So just keep all of that in mind. That is my side. No, I guess it is never too late, but it makes it an awful lot harder and more stressful. Change your lifestyle, live off one income, use that money to pay off school debt, and then have that life you want. It's easier when you only have $25,000 in debt. When you go for a career that takes you six or seven years and you have six digits of debt, then the, the creditors are already knocking at your door by the time that you're paying, doing all of that stuff. So it does make it a lot, a lot harder. Um, 
Okay, so essentially society is saying that debt isn't bad. It helps you get what you want right now, which is what we all want, right? We want what we want right now. Children are too much work. You should limit the size of your family so you can afford a nicer lifestyle and more things. Because we all need more things. Scripture, though, says that debt is a curse that is to be avoided at all costs, and children are a blessing, and God provides for the needs of each of his children. Okay, the sixth principle is about investing and saving, also known as steady plotting. Um, what we were taught in Crown is that after you give your first 10% to God, that your next check should be to your savings account because you need to make saving a priority. Whatever amount it is that you're able to fit into your budget, put that money aside and treat it as sacred because otherwise, if you wait until the end, after you pay all of your bills and then you might have a little bit of extra left, how, what's the reality? Are you going to put it into your savings account or are you going to keep it in your wallet and go to Timmy Ho's a couple extra times that week? Yeah, okay. So just, you need to make sure that you are making saving a priority and not just short-term savings for like buying a new car or buying a house, but long-term savings so that in the future you can take care of yourself when you retire. Um, also, does that, do you guys know what compound interest is? Okay, essentially what compound interest is, is that if you start saving early, it's not the greatest with the interest rates the way they are right now. It used to be an awful lot better. But you can actually save more by starting early and putting less into your account because if you leave it in the account, then the interest starts adding into it and then you're accruing interest on the bigger amount, like your, the amount that you had in there plus the interest earns interest, and then that amount earns interest, and so it like exponentially starts growing when you're putting more money in there. Mm -hmm. So even if you don't feel like you have a lot of money now, start saving <coughs> early, and try and find ways that you can save that will give you some in interest. Also, you're going to avoid risky investments. You're going to diversify. You don't want all your eggs in one basket, because I think a lot of people are feeling the burn from that with the, the last stock market thing that happened a few years ago and some people lost their entire retirement. Everything they had saved up was in one place and it was gone. So keep that in mind as well. And you need to balance your saving with giving generously. When you get to the point where you have wealth, you don't want to just hoard it for yourself. You can, you're still saving some, but you're also <coughs> giving generously so that it's balanced. Um, society says to spend all you make. However, if you should save, put your trust in your accumulated assets. But scripture says that the wise man saves for the future, but the foolish man spends whatever he gets. Okay, next will not apply to everybody right now, but it will apply to most of you in the future, and that is that you need to train your children to handle money as well. Once you learn how to handle money according to God's principles, don't let them be the lost generation that you forget to pass the information along to. Um, have you guys heard of Luis Palau? He's known as like the Billy Graham of Latin America. He was ministered to by a group of missionaries from the country of Wales, and he came to Christ. And then when he was an adult, I think that was when he was a teenager, he decided that he wanted to go to Wales to thank them for the impact that he, they had had on his life. And when he went back, he couldn't find like anybody that was going to church. I think he said at that point that less than 1% of the population in the country was church going. And that was just in one generation. So... They made such an impact on his life, but then didn't pass it along to their own children, and then it was all lost. They could have had such momentum going if they had kept it going to the next generation. So to teach biblical principles of handling money, parents should use these three methods. The first is communicating verbally, telling your kids how to do it. The second is modeling, because we all know that we are more likely to follow what people do than what they say. So if you're telling them how to do something and then doing the opposite yourself, which are they going to follow? What you're doing. So make sure you're not being <coughs> critical. And third, practical experience. And this is something that usually needs to happen outside of school because where are the opportunities to buy things? I mean, they've got limited opportunities at school, like buying their lunch or maybe a little bookstore, but most of the real opportunities for spending are in stores that are outside of the school day. So 
starting to like give your kids little allowances so that you can give them the chance to, to spend money or to save money giving them visuals of like this is going to the church and this is going to my savings account and this is what I can spend and showing them how they can save over time to do big purchases. I've heard of parents even like giving a loan, a real loan with interest on it to their kids to buy a bike and then they have to pay back the interest and the loan so that they learn about it and then they like treat that bike like it's gold because they really appreciate it and they know how hard it was to work for it and yeah just there's so many different ideas that you can use that will will train your kids how to use money. Um, really pray while you're training your children because um, because this whole thing is just relying on God. You can't do it by yourself. Um, it's helpful to also restrict and regulate their television viewing also for the same reasons that I said to restrict it for yourself so that you're not tempted to buy all of these different things and so that your kids are staying sweet because the more TV they watch, the meaner they seem to get. Uh. <laughs> There's one thing also I think parents can handle about spoiling their children. Like one thing yeah. we, we never did was like buy them stuff. Like even when we go to the store, we're like we bring them home a surprise, and it means so much more to them. Yep. Like my kids are never ready in stores or anything. They don't expect they're gonna get anything. You see all these other kids like flipping out. So That's I think awesome. it's just important to not spoil your, your children with like toys and stuff like right. that. Like, well, I have a couple of friends who even for <laughs> Christmas. Um, I wish I could remember what it was called. They they have, th I think it's three gifts that they get for each of their kids, but each one is in like a different category. Like there's one that's specifically to build their child up spiritually. There's one that's just like a fun gift. And then there's one other category. And those kids love those things. And they're all, like, they remember what they got for Christmas because they only got three things from mom and dad instead of everything piled under the Christmas tree. And then you can't remember what you opened five minutes before. So there's a lot that can go into that, lots of things to think and pray through. So society says that parents need not require their children to establish the discipline of managing money or of working hard, but scripture says that parents have the obligation to train a child to be a faithful steward and a wise money manager. Okay, and we are already on to our last of our principles, and our last principle is to spend wisely, which is where budgeting comes in. Um, did that paperwork its way all the way around so everybody could see the, um, the budget percentages from before? No. Yep, good. No, oh, here. Can you pass it? Thank you. Yeah. Like I said, if you don't fall into the single adult category, you can go on Crown's website and print your own that matches more what your family structure is. Um, but really, you're just going to start with beginning where you are today. Don't try and think, oh, well, I can start budgeting once I reach this point, or, oh, I just want to get past this big spending season. I've got a lot of family birthdays coming up. I don't really want to have to budget that stuff. No, you need to start now if you are really going to get on track with what God is wanting you to do with your finances. And if you spend more than you earn, there are only two solutions. You either earn more or you spend less. Or both. Or both. And that's a fantastic combination. But it's a lot easier said than done, isn't it? Either earning more or spending less. I think when I'm earning more, it's a lot easier to spend less. For some people, it is. It depends on your personality. So I would encourage you, I would encourage your first step with budgeting to be if you have any little expenses, things that you consider little because they only cost a couple of dollars, but maybe it's a weekly habit, maybe it's even a daily habit, maybe it's coffee, maybe it's lottery tickets, I know some people will go crazy on those, maybe it is going out to lunch for at a restaurant once a week at work. Multiply it out to see how much it would cost you in a year. Wow. And see if that doesn't change your mind about how much you're going to spend on those little things that add up to be big things. Just keep, you, you just have to change your mindset about so many different things when you're doing things according to God's way instead of according to the way that you've been told all your life you should be doing things by TV or by even teachers at school sometimes they mean well, but if they're not Christians, they're teaching you the ways of the world and it's just the way that it winds up being. So the next question is, what should our standard of living be? Um, 
I would encourage you to think with an eternal perspective. The Bible tells us that we are pilgrims, and pilgrims don't travel with very much. Pilgrims have the necessary things that they need to fulfill God's calling on their life, and that's what they have. Um, make an effort to live simply. Um, 1 Thessalonians 4, 11 through 12 says, Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with oh. your hands, just as we told you, so that your so that your so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders, and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. Um, you want to spend in a way that pleases the Lord, which does not mean that you never get to buy nice things. It just means that you need to make sure you're living within your means, and that you're being faithful with your finances, and that you're seeking the Lord about any of those extra purchases and making sure that you have his peace before you make those purchases. Mm -hmm. You you don't want to waste possessions, you don't want to compare yourself to others, and you definitely don't want to be conformed to this world. So keep those things in mind as you're figuring out your standard of living. Society says that you can acquire as many expensive possessions as possible because they are evidence that you are a successful, important person. But scripture says that this the excessive accumulation of possessions will distract you from fulfilling God's purpose for your life. So in conclusion, just to kind of put things into perspective a little bit, I've got a couple of quotes for you. One of them is by Edmund Burke, who is an author and philosopher, and he said that the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good people to do nothing. Deanna? I haven't gotten there yet. Oh, you didn't? Not yet. Oh. It's okay. It's coming soon. I thought you were ending with the quotes. I was getting nervous, too. No, I've got more. I've got more. It's, it's a long conclusion. Oh, there you go. That's fine. I like it. That's why. Okay. Um, I didn't know who had said this before, but it was Princess Diana who said, you can't comfort the afflicted without afflicting the comfortable. So if you think about comforting the afflicted in third world countries, we need to make ourselves less comfortable and afflict ourselves by thinking about what their sufferings are so that we then take action on it. And Solomon, the wisest man on earth and also the richest, in Ecclesiastes 5, 10 through 11, said, Whoever loves money never has money enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. This too is meaningless. As goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owner except to feast his eyes on them? So he understood, even though he was the richest man in the world, that money was not going to buy happiness and that it was not the end-all, be-all. Um, so that the one that you were asking about, money is not evil, it's morally neutral. It has to do with how you choose to use your money. You can use your money for evil, you could use your money for good. But the money itself is neutral. <coughs> but the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. That was 1 Timothy 6.10. So the last things that I wanted to, to kind of talk about are the difference between, we already talked about this a little bit, so we can just kind of summarize the difference between American being poor in America and being poor in a third world country. We already said that essentially, if you're poor in America, you usually still have shelter, you usually still have clothing and <coughs> food, so you usually have your basic needs. Also in America, we have a welfare system, we have social assistance programs that do not exist in some of these other countries. You're just essentially on your own if you can't take care of yourself or you don't have family to take care of you. Um, so why do you think that we have been blessed in America? To be a blessing. That's the perfect answer. To be a blessing to others. Okay, we have not been blessed solely so that we can enjoy the lap of luxury and buy everything that our heart desires. We have been blessed so that we can pass that blessing along to other people. So that is the end. I, Joel, do you have the sign-up sheet for anybody that's interested in the Crown Study? Ooh, we're going to pass this around. Um, it's going to be meeting on Monday nights at, I think it's going to be at our house um, in Orchard Park. And it'll be in the evening. 
it's actually a collegiate study. The one that we had done originally was meant for married couples. This one is meant for single adults. So it should be a good fit for most of this group. Um, and I would really strongly encourage you to, to go through the full 10 weeks. It was really life changing. Huh? On Monday nights. I'm not sure yet when we're starting. In Orchard Park, yeah. It's about 10 minutes from here. Yeah. I'm not sure.